uh, favourite parkland courses uh, that I've ever played. And I know the work that's been done there to, to improve it and make it even better in terms of their drainage. The greens are always uh, pristine. The caddies, the experience, it's, and that's something that golfers... Um, you can go and play a really good golf course, but if you go and play a really good golf course and then the service and the experience is just as good, you know, that makes it very, very special. And that's why Loch Lomond is a very special place to play golf. Um, and it's very difficult to get on. And I know members as well, uh, you know, members just um, don't bring people um, out of the blue. You know, it's, it's very much a, a club that sticks together and, um, yeah. you know, it's a very special club. So it's right up there. And, even a parkland golf course in the heart of Belfast, Malone. Um, I, mm -hmm. you know, I love it. Some serious work has been done to it over the last couple of years. New greens, um, greens put back towards the lock. A uh, good story, actually, from the, the 15th. I was playing with um, Davy Irwin, former British and Irish Lions player, played in the centre back in, what, 84, 85? No, even earlier than that, in the 70s for, for the Lions. Um, and I was playing with David Humphreys, and it was me and Rory McIlroy versus David oh. Humphreys and, and, and Doc Irwin. Oh. And uh, Rory and I standing on the 15th green were, were, th were we three up? Yeah, we were three up, standing on the 15th green, uh, or 15th tee, uh, and I pull out a pitching wedge and I shank it. And there used to be this wee wooden uh, like gazebo <laughs> thing over on the right-hand side that's, that's now not there. And like I, 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 I sort of headed in behind it, and there was a few laughs. And of course, Dave Humphreys plays off three or four uh, out of you know, Port Rush, and he knocks it in the middle of the green. And Davey Irwin knocks it in the middle of the green. Rory sticks it to 15 feet or whatever. And they're all slagging me, ah, ha, ha, you know, you're, you're rubbish, blah, blah, blah. And then I went over, I got the 56 degree wedge out, and like duffed it. But like I duffed it, we kept on rolling and dropped in for a two, and we won the match. No. <laughs> yeah. 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 So um, it was a good story for Malone on the fifteenth, which has had a lot of work done to it as well over the years, and a fantastic golf hole. So that was a four and two. That was a four and two. So Stephen, yeah. for you, yeah, for you, Stephen, golf courses that stand out. Oh, listen! It, it, for me, it's the, it's an easy answer. Royal Port Rush is the best golf course in the world, not just the best golf course in Northern Ireland. Um, I've been fortunate enough to play a lot of a lot of golf um, in in many different countries, uh, but Royal Port Rush is just a special, special place. It's so much it deserved the Open Championship and going there in, in twenty nineteen. I'm absolutely mm -hmm. thrilled that it, that it's going back mm -hmm. again so soon. Because it it deserves it. It was such a success in 2019. I, I just love the golf course because it you know it's it's on it's a special place on the north coast of Northern Ireland, and the views are are spectacular. You probably don't see quite as much of the sea as you think you would, you know, at, at Port Rush, I suppose. But some of the views when you're standing on the fifth tee, looking down onto that iconic fifth green, you know, the the, the with the sixth par three after it, the two new holes that they've built. The seventh and eighth look like they've been there for for a hundred years. They're absolutely wonderful, and I just think the whole experience of going to play Port Rush. I I love it. Look, I I, I love Royal County Down as well. Um, I mean, I was there playing this morning with Olivia Mahaffey, who's uh, going to be a you know a big right. talent, a professional from, from Northern good. Ireland. What a what a yeah. wonderful wonderful player and a and a lovely charismatic long, young lady she is. Um, but the, a lot of the blind shots there catch me out, you know. But the the more you play County Down the more you kind of fall in love with the place but it, i can understand yeah. people going for the first time and they walk away they've probably lost 10 balls they haven't been able to see where they're going off a couple of the tees and and you know you suddenly you can think oh what was happening there but the more you go back it is just it is also a wonderful place to play golf we, we are you know blessed and privileged in northern ireland to have so many good golf courses whether they're links or their parklands Stephen mentioned Malone, Beaver Park's another wonderful par yeah. you know, parkland. Uh, I play a, a golf at Shandon Park as well here in Belfast, which you've got some of the, the best greens in, in Northern Ireland. And then, you know, a shout out to Art Glass as well, where yeah. Stephen and I have yeah. played quite yeah. a bit too. It's a it's a really, really, you know, good, fun golf course with, with views of the water from all 18 holes with that beautiful old, you know, clubhouse style building, um, which is centuries old. And it's anybody coming to, to Northern Ireland, it's a, it's another really good place to go. Yeah, yeah, there's no doubt. We are totally blessed uh, with golf courses. It's incredible. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I can't remember what Ronan Rafferty uh, on, but it hasn't been, we're going to release it. 
uh, sort of at Christmas time. Uh, and we're good story about Ronan Rafferty Bill. Right. Go, go, Stephen. So, go. so I was with um, uh, Chris McDowell, who's a, a member of Loch Lomond, who you he know. He is. He is. And um, we would know each other through the in, insurance industry. And we were, yeah. it was when, when the renovations or the work was being done at Loch Lomond and the drivable 14th, is it? Yep. At Loch Lomond, the drivable 14th. It, yep. it was in the part, it was turned into a part for three for, 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 <laughs> for a few uh, few months because of the, the turfing yeah. and the seating. Yeah. And it was only Chris and I, we had rocked up pretty early. And the next thing we get this wave through from the group in front of us and Chris was like right Stevie come on quick we'll, you know, we'll play through these here we'll get back to the clubhouse get a lovely bottle of red wine we'll get in nice feet get our feet up right what are you hitting and I was like oh it's right 180 yards I'll, I'll hit a 7 iron and I hit a 7 iron to like 10 feet and then <laughs> next thing next thing Chris hit one around the green somewhere and walked up and this guy came over to me and he's wearing a baseball cap and he's like well how are you getting on he was talking to me he's like where are you from I was like oh Northern Ireland he's like oh I that's where I'm from, you know. I spent a bit of time there. I was like, all oh, right, whereabouts? He's like, oh, you know, down at Lurgan Golf Club and here and there. I was like, oh, do you know such and such? And he was like, oh, yeah, no. Well, I was like, all right, nice one, mate. Sure. Thanks for letting us play through. And he's like, right, cheers. So I walk up to my putt. There's this big bendy putt. And I just tapped it. And the way the green kind of falls down to the left, Bill, and it was up in the wee plateau, and I dropped it in for a two. And your man, <laughs> Your, your, your man turns around to me and goes, oh, fantastic, fantastic. That was absolutely fantastic. I was like, all right, cheers, mate. See you later. <laughs> I walks off and my caddy uh, turns around to me, the, the caddy master. And he says, you know who that was? I says, no, no, he was talk, talking to me about Northern Ireland and all. I had no idea who he is. He seemed quite keen. I like goes, yeah, that's Ronan Rafford, I guess. Like, <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> 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 so uh, yeah, yeah. I, I've seen I've seen him around the club a couple of times afterwards, yeah. but I've never I've never had the um, courage to go up to him and say, by the way, I, I, my apologies, I didn't. Uh, you know, well, I, 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 on, on the green. A, a great guy, and and yeah, a really good guy. Um, and it's a good it's a good interview. Some insight, and they played the Ryder Cup. Uh, 89 at Belfry and it was a, a momentous occasion so that's on it but uh, he used to do a show um, and I honestly can't remember what it was called uh, and it was Great Golf Journeys it was called Great Great that's, Great Golf Journeys I think it was great, called in, in, you're in quite UTV right. that's right UTV and he did yeah. Fintan it nine holes at Fintan there's a wee golf club which you're people <laughs> nine holes at Fintan and he, he and that's where my father's from, Vintana. And uh, and, I, and I said, how did you choose Vintana? I mean, nobody ever talked. But I went and played it. And actually, you know, it is a pretty tidy place. Uh, it's a pretty tidy golf course. And his memory is absolutely terrific. Uh, he said, well, you know, um, he said the 18th over the, the, the river, which it is. Uh, and uh, he was able to describe, you know, some of the experiences around Vintana. And I said, gee. Ronan, that's like years ago. Uh, and he said, yeah, I just have a, I just can remember things, you know, on a golf course. And I guess that's part of, uh, um, you know, I, I suppose that's part of a skill or part of his sort of background that he can. But I was very surprised last week with Robbo on Mark Robson. You might have watched it and claiming <laughs> Robbo claimed to play in the same sort of level as Ronan and David Faherty. Her play to him. Yeah, right. And you believe that? And you, and you actually believe that, did you? you, oh, you no. <laughs> <laughs> so, Stephen, listen, I, I <laughs> so I remember, um, I remember us uh, meeting Rory uh, and it was a bit of a lunch thing and, and, and I don't know, he was about 16 or 17 maybe in, in Belfast uh, and we were talking about why are pros not particularly keen on signing golf balls? I don't know if you remember this or not. Uh, and, you know, the, the reason is because we, we thought, well, we didn't know what the reason was, but it was because the find is so bloody awkward, I think. It was generally. Uh, <laughs> but but you had, you know, as I said, I had a connection with Rory at the start for sure. And it's always nice if you ever bump in. And certainly with Harry, he was a clandy boy and, and everything. So how did your connection with Rory begin? Uh, Stephen, because you know it is a you've got a long relationship there, and uh, you know I know it's something you you, you value very much. 
Yes, I do. Um, Rory McIlroy has always been a fine young man. Um, I, I've had the privilege of knowing him since he was probably 12 or 13 years old when he was bursting onto the amateur scene. And obviously, we just started doing some you know, stories on him um, because he was a, a wonder kid at one world championships at underage level. And, and really, from, from then on, we just kept tabs on him and we kept doing stories on him and obviously he was going to be you know a big sporting star we always thought that that was going to happen and then through time i suppose um it becomes more than a, a working relationship and, and and you become friends with 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 him and like stephen who's got to know rory as well you know he he really hasn't changed a bit since the day and hour i met him apart from turning from a boy into a man obviously yeah. He, yeah. he is an, an absolutely wonderful ambassador for northern ireland what he has done for this country he's like a he's like a moving billboard for northern ireland wherever he goes around the world and uh, you know S S stephen it will be the same as me i know i always take great exception when i hear people especially from here criticizing Rory yeah. for doing this yeah. or not doing that or he didn't do this or yeah. he, because look, we, we are very fortunate in Northern Ireland to have Rory McIlroy this is a once in a generation sporting talent from these shores and of course he's not always going to get everything right but you know people I, I sometimes sit at, dinner, at dinners with people and they say oh Rory McIlroy's done this oh he's done that and you know he should be changing his caddy he should be changing his swing he should be yeah. changing his putter and my simple answer to any of those people is, do you play golf yourself? Yes. What is your handicap? 20. Well, you're not really in a position to, to try and give Murray McElroy <laughs> advice about his golf swing. <laughs> um, I, I, I just think what he has done for this country, you know, winning, you know, four major championships, pretty much everything there is in the sport to win apart from the Masters and an Olympic gold medal, if that's something that he, you know, puts up there as, as is important on his golfing CV. But I, I just think what he has done for, for Northern Ireland is is, is just, honestly, it, it's wonderful. And when you get to the very top, you know, people in Ireland always like to knock you down for some unknown reason. Yeah. So, I, and yes, I probably get a lot of criticism from people at times saying, oh, you're just like the Rory McIlroy fan club. Um, but that's not the case. We, you know, I'm here to report on, on Rory's sporting success. I hope and I think most people understand when we are away from home covering Rory McIlroy, we're covering Rory McIlroy for everyone at home to, to, to showcase his success. And, and we have always been very fortunate and I have certainly been very fortunate that we don't obviously try and take advantage of the situation that we have a good mm -hmm. relationship with Rory. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we pick and choose our moments, I'd like to think, because we don't want to become a pain. But at any point, we we have wanted an interview with with Rory, and we're away from home. He, like the other golfers, our major champions, North and South, always make time for yeah. the journalists, and especially for us from 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 Northern Ireland, because they know when they speak to us that 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 they are speaking to the audience in Northern Ireland and in Ireland, and for all of them, that is something that is very very important. Whether it's Darren Clark, Rory McIlroy, Graham McDowell. Or, or, or Podrick Harrington, Shane Larry from you know, the public land side, they know that they're speaking to the audience at home and where they're from is very, very important. And you know, I've had the privilege of being, I suppose, on the inside when, when they won their major championship, certainly for Rory and Darren and Graham, um, because we were filming documentaries with them at the time and they allowed us on the inside to, to capture very personal moments. And I know from being involved in that how much being from Northern Ireland means to them all. And, you know, they, they couldn't wait to, to come home and celebrate their, their major success with yeah. everybody from Northern Ireland. And I, and I think yeah. that says, you know, a, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot about them. Yeah. No, Can I just say about Roy McElroy? I mean, the, island of, the people of Ireland, North and South, should be proud of him because he oh. is the best golfer in the world. And I quantify it. He's not the, ranked the world number one. But if every golfer takes their A game to a specific tournament, Roy McIlroy wins it every time because his uh, it's, it's, it's best game is better than everyone else's best game, and that's how I quantify Roy McIlroy. He is the best golfer in the world on his A on his A game. Absolutely, no doubt about it. Well, I mean, I think we all hear here. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. I agree. With, I agree with. I mean, I I agree with you one hundred percent. Um, I, I I he's not just one of the he's not just the greatest golfer in, in the world. Although I suppose look. 
you got to argue that Tiger Woods is, <laughs> if he's back to full well, fitness, yeah. is, is is going to be right up there. But he, he is one of the best sporting sportsmen or women on this planet. He is from Northern Ireland, and we should oh. all be very, very proud and feel very, very fortunate that yeah, he yeah. came along dur- during our time, and we've been able to to celebrate his <laughs> his success. I. Look, I've been really lucky to go to the Masters Golf Tournament since 2009 when he made his debut, and nothing would give me more pleasure than to be able to be there reporting on him slipping on the green jacket and becoming the first golfer from Ireland to, to do that. You know, selfishly, I could say I hope he doesn't win it for another 10 years because then I can go every year to, to report on the match. <laughs> but, but, but that's not the case. I just, look, I'd love, I'd love to, see him, to see him win the Masters. I think it would be absolutely... It would just be, it would be I suppose the complete set and one of yeah. a handful of people in, in, in the world to ever have achieved the Grand Slam. And I think he deserves it. He's such a special talent. Yeah. And, and you know, um, you know, he holds himself as well. He's very well thought of in the USA, very well thought of and amongst his peers as well, which says a lot. Uh, we've got a question for Coachy, but Stevie, you want to add anything to the to Rory? You've played golf with him. With a question just come in, guys, that we're going to ask, ask you, but what's your views on Rory? Oh yeah, like um, I, you know, people's lives change and they move on, and like he's living in the states now, and like you know, there's just a few text messages every you know year or two. Where way back, you know, when I was playing rugby for Ulster, he would have joined us on nights out. And he, you know, when he got home around Christmas time, would have been able to go out for a few beers, and we socialised a hell of a lot more. But you know, Bill, even back then, there were there was no camera phones being pointed in your face every 10 seconds and you know um you know we, we were in new york the other patty wallace uh, nal o'connor who's a very accomplished golfer himself um and, and, and me were out in new york with uh, with rory and we went down to philadelphia and watched a, an nfl game just as i retired i think it was 2014 and we ended up playing a game of golf rory couldn't join us he was uh, had to get back home for practice but we Played down in Doral, down just in the outskirts of Miami, and was really, you know, set everything up for us. Him and his, his agent Sean, and um, you know, he went out of his way to to help us out to, to catch up. Um, you know, it'd be brilliant to be able to do that more often, um, and, and you know, be able to catch up. But everybody's lives change. You know, we all have family. He's now a father himself, so yeah. am I. You know, we all have different interests and in how we spend our time. But you know, I just watch him on the TV now every single tournament every single minute when you flick the tv on i'm not looking for yeah you know, an interview I, all i want to see is rory McIlroy play shots and like yeah. there's so many yeah. other people everybody that else want, want to do the same wants to yeah. do the same thing so yeah. um no uh, as a bloke he he's uh he's 100 um and yeah a lot of admiration for him and i would just like to see him go on and you know get that green jacket just to put the icing on the cake and yeah, here, here, we all agree with that. Questions come in from Barry Coates. Uh, this guy's a good lad, a uh, member of Clandy Boy Golf Club. Um, so to you, Stephen, who has been the most difficult person to interview? <laughs> uh, uh, thanks to Barry. And I should have mentioned Clandy Boy earlier. He had a, a, a fabulous uh, event there during the during the summer. Uh, had yeah. a Euro Pro event was uh, the course was immaculate. Uh, the members, I have to say, got right behind the tournament. It was a really yeah. really big success. So you know, big big congratulations to Clandy Boy for that. And um, the the most difficult person I ever had to interview uh, was probably Sir Garfield Sobers. But Whoa. I got him on a bad day. I think I got him on a bad day when I was a very young reporter because I've heard after that that he is a gent and a, and a very, very nice man. So that was a difficult interview for me at the time when I was just starting out. But the the most difficult interview is probably Roy Keane um, in 2002 <laughs> uh, when he was sent home from Ooh. the World Cup. <laughs> yeah. um, well, this is very look, famous. It's, it's almost 20 years. Yeah, it's 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 almost twenty years ago now, but he was sent home as captain of his country, captain of Manchester United, uh, from from the World Cup. Ireland were training on a on a tiny island called Saipan, just off Japan, and you know the press corps all left Saipan and moved to Japan. There was only about six of us who decided to stay behind on the island to try and get an interview with Roy Keane, 
Um, he, <laughs> I got an education spending some time with the photographers from the News of the World, etc., about uh, how they, they were determined they were going to get a photograph of Roy Keane before he left that island, come hell or high water. So eventually, to cut a long story short, um, they had kind of, the photographers had kind of paid people a few quid here and there to keep them posted. So a guy in the hotel who was one of the porters came running out and he said, Mr. Keane has just left from the back door in an unmarked van. So we all chased to the airport ourselves, managed to get to the airport just before Roy Keane. He jumped out of the van. The photographers had their pictures. My camera crew had their um, footage. And then we decided to take our lives in our hands. And I thought, right, I'm going to ask him for an interview. So he was standing at a, an outdoor check-in um, because it was a very small island. People didn't actually know who he was. This is a small island in the middle of nowhere. So I went up and asked him about seven or eight questions and he never spoke. Um, and he is really intimidating. Um, he's he's much bigger than, he, than I'd imagined. I've never really seen him in real life up close. So um, that... We, we then thought, right, he hasn't said anything. And we kind of put the camera down and went away, waited five minutes. He was still in the queue. And I thought, right, we'll go back again and have another dig. So we went back and asked another three or four questions. And eventually he started giving us, giving us a, a, a little bit of stuff. So I remember and said, look, have you any regrets? And he went, no regrets. And a few more questions anyway. It was short and sweet. It was difficult. Became a very memorable interview. And then I read, I think it was Niall Quinn's book, um, afterwards or Mick McCarthy's and the players in the dressing room wrote on the wall no regrets and that obviously from Roy Keane's interview so I kind of felt we played a you know a, a little part in, in in World Cup and the success that Ireland went on to have they eventually got put out although they had, had Roy Keane stand I think they'd, they'd have gone a little further in the tournament so that was a memorable and probably um probably very difficult interview I would say <laughs> Well, Stephen, Stephen, that went worldwide. That went worldwide, didn't it? The fact that you you were the only person that got it. Did. It did. Yeah. It did. Yes, it did. Um, I mean, it's funny because at that time in 2002, you know, there there weren't satellite trucks on the island. You couldn't just send your footage back by your, you know, by your phone. There were no mobile phones. I was on a satellite phone. So I had this footage on a tape of Roy Keane, a world exclusive interview that uh, that he had just been obviously sent home in disgrace from the World Cup. And I thought, what will I do with it? I've got to get this out. So I actually gave the tape to someone who was getting on the flight and said, I will get somebody from our Tokyo office to meet you coming off the flight. <laughs> so this person took the tape on the flight and then somebody met him at the other end, uh, took the tape back to the Tokyo Bureau and sent it back and, and and the rest is history but look it was the first experience for me as a young reporter of being involved in a story that became global um it was wow. just it was the world cup biggest sports event in the world you know, wow. except for the olympics i suppose but this was a huge controversy at the time because it was roy Keane, because it was manchester united i think actually i have a photograph with somewhere sitting around because it was such a memorable moment in my own career i suppose um i did go back a few years later i did meet him at a rugby international at lansdowne road and I jumped in to ask him another question, but he just gave me the absolute stare of death and walked straight <laughs> past. But, <Yeah>. but <laughs> and, and he, and he it probably he probably didn't even remember it was me from Saipan. It was probably just because I was trying to interview him. But um, next year is the 20th anniversary of that. And I'm thinking to myself, really, wouldn't it be nice to go back just to, to have, another, yeah. have another interview with Roy? Oh, but I well, can't you, see you it definitely... happening. You definitely should. I mean, we've got to get through the questions. Quite a few have come in. So uh, for you, Stevie, Barry has asked, who is the best player you've ever played with and against? Um, I'll, I'll keep it short and sweet um, on, on this one. The uh, best player I played with was probably um, – it, it changes all the time. Like, so it does. Um, <laughs> I, I, I played with Johnny Sexton under 18s, 19s, 21s, the whole way through, and he's at the top of his game at the minute. So I'm going to say him this week. It might change next week. Um, and played against would be a guy called Jerome Kano, who played uh, number six. He played number eight a good bit as well for New Zealand. Played yeah. a lot of rugby um, for Toulouse as well at the, the back end of his career. But a colossus of a man – Huge man, um, big physicality, um, good run with the ball, very skillful, and he loved to dominate people in the tackle. So, yeah, um, 
he was uh, he was almost somebody I looked up to, like in my younger years playing rugby, and somebody like Jerry Collins as well. God rest his soul, who's, who's passed away unfortunately. Mm. Um, play got to play against him a few times against the All Blacks, of course, and against the Ospreys when he was there. So a couple of big hitters from New Zealand. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, uh, you know, Stephen was talking about the interview with Roy Keane, which which went global. But you know, Stevie, you were known for something called the wraparound tackle. I think was that was that, <laughs> attributed. That was attributed Stevie to you, wasn't it? So just describe the wraparound tackle. Oh, geez, the wraparound tackle performed in every nightclub in New Zealand, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, Robert uh, Ryan tackle. My goodness me. Yeah, no, like when when was that there? It was two thousand and eleven rugby world cup, wasn't it, Stephen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The Australia game. Yeah, the, the, the Australia game. Um a lot of people were thinking it was George Gregan, uh, but it wasn't, it was actually Will Genia. So uh yeah, there was just a tackle, a scrum was went down. Um, Ireland were playing against Australia. Was that the first game or second game? So maybe a second game. I think it was USA the first game, second game. And there was lots of scrums and lots of niggle. Uh, we got the upper hand in one of the scrums. Um, I probably broke my bind a little bit early and, and got away with it and wrapped Will Kenny up. And uh, that's where the wrap around <laughs> tackle comes from. And drove him back five or six yards. And then a few lads came in behind me. And we actually won. I don't think it was a penalty. I think it was a. Um, to scrum the us so it was a big turning point in that game actually it was on a bit of a knife edge and it was kind of give us a bit of belief before getting in at half time and uh yeah the wraparound tackle performed in new zealand in 2011 against australia bill yeah i know <laughs> i remember it and uh well that's attributed to you so uh you know uh nice explanation as well stephen you, you played golf and represented gb in northern ireland in the world transplant games um, you know, this is something obviously that uh, you know you're well known for, maybe locally or, or whatever. W what was that experience like, and, and where did you actually play? Uh, well, look, I, I, I was able to take part in the transplant games for those who don't know, because I had a, a kidney transplant over 30 years ago, which mm -hmm. um, it's failed a couple of years ago. So I was fortunate enough to have a second kidney transplant uh, just at the end of 2019 which was um, I'm very, very thankful for, and I'm obviously feeling fantastic now. Um, yeah. But back, oh, it, it was in the mid nineties, probably. I went to the British Transplant Games regularly and played tennis and golf. Uh, I was fortunate enough to win gold medals in, in golf and tennis for the, at the British Transplant Games. And then that got me selected for the, you know, for Team GB and, and, and NI to go to the World Transplant Games in, in Australia. Now, right. I, I went to the games, I got a bye in the first round of the tennis and then got stuffed, like I didn't even win a point hardly in my match because I met, I met the guy who went on to win it. Uh, I played, I then played doubles and again got stuffed. So I went the other side of the world to play a couple of tennis matches <laughs> to represent Team GB. Um, but it wasn't, the, it really wasn't the, the taking, you know, what it wasn't the, the sport that was the most important part. The memories that I have are standing on the steps of the Sydney Opera House for a photo opportunity with literally thousands of other people from around the world uh, who all had undergone life-saving transplant operations, whether that was, Amazing. you know, kidney transplant, heart, yeah. liver, lung, pancreas, whatever that may be. And um, that was a, you know, incredible experience to meet to meet so many people who had who had gone through the the same thing. It was actually, I always remember there was two guys who got on stage and they sang a duet. And they each had each other's heart. One, you know, needed a heart and lungs, and one needed a heart. Whatever way they'd done the operation, they both had each other's hearts, and they got up and sang a duet. And I mean, it was it was overwhelming just to, to hear the stories and meet the people. Um, so that was that was the best of that experience for 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 me. I'm, I'm sure your kidney got a good workout anyway, Stephen, with the amount of beer that you drank when you were over there as well. <laughs> I was just thinking that, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah probably back in the day yeah it was my, my first kidney my first kidney came from my dad so it was probably well used to having the odd tipple here or there okay well we've got um fergie has asked a question uh about uh stevie how did you take your fitness to another level to play for the british lions and what were the toughest sacrifices 
Yeah, back in 2009, getting selected for the Lions was the pinnacle of my career, for sure. Um, but there was a hell of a lot of training went into that, and I certainly hit the ground running over in South Africa and felt I was the fittest I'd ever been. Lots of altitude training with uh, Johnny Davis, who was the former SSC coach of, of Ulster and Irish rugby. Uh, worked very closely with him for a significant period of time before actually stepping onto the plane. So um, I felt like I was almost a step ahead when I got to the Penny Hill Park Hotel uh, in London, just outside London. Um, and we started training and, uh, you know, e even in those practice sessions uh, in the week leading up to, um, you know, the, those first matches, I, I, I felt like I was on a different level. And unfortunately, I picked up a niggle, picked my MCL in training just before the first test and that put me out of the tour. But um, I could totally really look back on that with any regrets uh, at all. I, I give it my all. Um, as you know, you guys know, I played every game. Um at a million miles an hour. Um, it didn't matter if it was, uh, you know, zebra at home or, you know, South Africa in the British and Irish Lions. I would have played the same way. And I think that's why people enjoyed watching me play, you know, most weeks. Um, yeah, uh, but just got myself into frightening shape. Lots of weight li weightlifting as well, which I enjoyed. Um, and I think it was a lot easier for me, Bill, because I did enjoy it. I did, did enjoy um, you know, going to the well, put my my body under massive stress, um, the recovery as well. Of course, you're sacrificing nights out with friends, going party and drinking or whatever. Uh, but yeah, it was only a short period of time that they really had to knuckle down. But um, yeah, I enjoyed it, and uh, yeah, it was a, a few kgs heavier than I than I am now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, I'm sure people watching. Well, may or may not know because it is golf generally, but you know, Stephen Ferris, you're talking about probably one of the finest rugby players to play for certainly Ulster, no doubt about that. Uh, Ireland, Thanks, Bill. you know, no, come on. Uh, I think Stephen, you'd back that one up. Uh, oh, listen, absolutely, Stephen, not not to, to, to try and embarrass him while he's on the call, but you know, <laughs> yeah, Stephen well, uh, <laughs> is undoubtedly. Uh, yeah, he's undoubtedly one of the best rugby players this country has ever produced, north oh. or south. He had a yeah. wonderful career. I was, I was like many other people, were so disappointed that his career was cut short um, by yeah. injury so soon because he could have played so many more years. He was a ferocious uh, talent, um, you know, a, a wonderful player and himself a great ambassador for this country and continues to be okay. so through the work that he does on television as a as a oh, pundit. Thanks. Um, thanks very much. I'm playing, you're dying. I'm playing a golf match against him next week, so I'll just... I'll just <laughs> <for a while. laughs> Stephen, you're now delighted that I'm retired because now you've got somebody to play golf with. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> but it's, but it's true. Now, Adrian, Adrian McLaughlin, uh, with you, if you know that name, uh, I'm yeah. sure you do. Adrian's a great lad, uh, yeah. really good lad. And Adrian, thank you for sending this question in. Or more, he was sort of, uh, uh, he, he went up Kilimanjaro with you, Stevie. Yeah. And uh, he said he found your insight fascinating. Uh, and, uh, you know, what, what was your, your experiences of going up Kilimanjaro? Uh, he would like to know. What, what What's your thoughts about it? Oh, jeez. Do you know what? I'd love to do it again. You'd like, never do it again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought I survived. Somewhere in, the, somewhere in the back of my head is telling me I'd love to do it again, but you're right, Stephen. I probably never will. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I would love to, I would love to, um, I would definitely love to climb a mountain over 6,000 metres. Uh, Kilimanjaro is 5,980 over 85 uh, metres. And there's just something, like I, again, I train very hard. Uh, Mark Robson, who you had on, uh, yeah. you know, he's in the an awful lot. We we did a lot of training, um, and he assisted me in that. But you know, going to Kilimanjaro, the thing that I will take away from it is the experience from the the porters, the people that help you up the mountain. Um, you know, who are maybe working for what fifty p a day, or you know, the tip that they get at the end of the trip, the end of the the two weeks. You know, that's to keep them going until they can get back onto the mountain to to get another. Yeah to go up to the top and you know the porters were carrying walking past us carrying gas canisters on their head and a pair of flip-flops um you know up a, a rocky you know pathway um getting to the top maybe 25 of them 30 of them staying in a, a tent that would you know, we would maybe think's a, a six eight man tent and 
and they're all sleeping in it together. Um, the chefs have cooked us our, our food. Um, yeah, we, it was basic. Of course, it's going to be basic when you're living on a mountain, but it served its purpose and it was you know, done so well for us. Um, and that's what I'll take away is the memories that they gave us. And they did not stop singing the whole time we were on that mountain and, and got us all to the top. And, and just lastly, it was probably a lot harder than I thought it was going to be, especially that that last night where we had to wake up at stupid o'clock uh, and get our boots on and get up the summit more or less for the sun coming up and you know we were up there no energy minus 20 odd you know your water what water had frozen so we didn't have any water left and, and then um yeah i didn't hang around up there uh, at all um the group the guys of shane burn was in it and big mike mccarthy uh, former irish rugby player as well and i just needed to get down the mountain i said right lads I'm, I'm away here and they're like oh okay so there's people obviously filtering down the mountain and i just took myself off and went the, the whole way down on my own then to it was co- called kosovo camp um and yeah waited for people coming back but as soon as i got down there i get into my tent and i had the best sleep of my life <laughs> it was unbelievable <laughs> i can remember mike mccarthy coming into my tent or our tent we were sharing two six foot four or five lads like sharing a tent uh, anyway uh, there's a few <laughs> baby wet, wet wipe stories but we'll not go into that um yeah and, and he un- unzipped it unzipped the tent and he's like fez fez and i was just like what and he goes mate you've been sleeping for like five hours i was like oh this is just unbelievable and then that was the, the reset button hit and we were able to get down the mountain but you know, just a good group of people um of course it was all for charity lots of money raised um for there a few charitable across the um, you know, to do it with a good few of the, the Ulster supporters and Ulster lads who spent their own money out of their own pocket to go and do it. You know, fair play, and we all thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, well, what a hell of an experience that would have been. And as a side note, Adrian says that, uh, Stephen, you were the first person his wife told uh, that they that both Adrian and her were engaged uh, and they met you uh, it was must have been the uh, well. It was in the Anchor Bar, Port Stewart, um, when the Northwest Two Hundred was on the go. Yeah, yeah? <laughs> I don't know. Do you remember? Yes, that? that's absolutely. You do. That's absolutely. That's absolutely correct. Yes, obviously the Anchor yeah. Bar in Port yeah. Stewart is one of the many hubs of activity during the Northwest Two Hundred, which is northern ireland's biggest outdoor sporting event an absolutely brilliant sporting occasion it is I, I i love the road racing i love motorcycling once once you're kind of part of the road racing family they don't let you back out and you're, yeah. you're kind of in there for for life so yeah it's a, it's look it's a it's a wonderful event and it's a it's a good spot as well during the during the northwest 200. well well thanks adrian that was that was great now billy you have you another question that's come in i do for mark mark in belfast this is, could be for both of you. He says, Ulster rugby legend Ruan PNR left in controversial circumstances, widely blamed on the Dublin based IRFU. He's now been away for several seasons. As time goes by, how likely do they feel that Ruan could return to the province in some official rugby capacity? Good question. Uh, I'll go Do first. You know like, uh, I'll, I'll go first. Yeah, yeah like, like it, it was a, an IRFU decision that Ruan Pienaar couldn't extend his contract again with Ulster Rugby, but then he was blocking the likes of John Cooney coming through, and now you even like Ruan Pienaar is still playing rugby for the Sharks, and we have young Nathan Doak coming through at Ulster Rugby. So would he, if he was at Ulster, be blocking Nathan Doak from coming through? And the answer to that is yes. So um, at the time, of course, everybody was devastated that he was going to be leaving, but I actually think. On hindsight, looking back at it now, it was probably the right one. Maybe a, a year later than it was, he could have been extended for another year. But I, mm-hmm. honestly, um, the, the way some of these young players have come through, I think it was a, a really smart decision at the time. Stephen? Yeah, I, I, I think as well, one more year would have been good if we if Elster could have kept him for one more year but suddenly John Cooney arrives and you have to say to yourself the impact that he made not just you know in the in the scrum half role but also through his goal kicking as well it, it turned out that it actually was probably the correct decision by the Irish Rugby Football Union and um, but Ruan Painter is one of life's gentlemen he's a tremendous tremendous rugby player 
I know Stephen and I, you know, we, we, we talk to him by text, you know, now, now and again still and have kept in touch with him. And, and I know he would love to come back to Northern Ireland at some point. Um, I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I still think he has a house here. Um, and it would not surprise me if he ended up back in Northern Ireland at some stage. And I would love to see him involved with the Ulster Rugby Academy um, in some shape or form, if that's, if that's something he would like to do. Um, in, in years to come. But then again, there are many other former Ulster players who could also do that role within the, the academy as well. But look, he was a he was a big name player for, for Ulster. He loved his time here. And it, it wouldn't surprise me if he if he came back here someday to in, in some shape or form. Yeah, yeah, he was really yeah, he was a he was a legend. Um right. ch- chaps, we're we're coming, believe it or not, to the end of the show, but we, we can't really go without talking about uh, the race to Dubai. You know, we've got to leave it on a, on a golf note. Uh, obviously, what happened to Rory on the 15th was unbelievably luck- unlucky. Morikawa, however, is, yeah, um, you know, is, some, is sensational. The iron play from that guy. You know, Morikawa, six wins, two majors, 25 top tens. You know, now a race to Dubai title. Um, what was your thoughts watching the race of Dubai, the final few holes? I didn't get to see the final yeah. round, unfortunately, um, because it was down working um, for Channel 4 for Ireland versus Argentina. So I was keeping up to date. Paddy Wallace, a good friend of, of ours, he is actually out in Dubai. So he was texting me saying, oh, it looks like Rory's not going to do it. And I was like, I just checked Sky Sports, uh, the leaderboard, and he was 15 under. I was like, he's two shot lead. But obviously it hadn't caught up in time. Uh, Paddy was out there on the ground and obviously he lost a couple of shots. And more kind of had, had probably a good few of the, the last hole. So yeah, hugely disappointing. His new nickname is now Hulk Hogan for ripping yeah. his shirt apart. <laughs> but showing some, frust- <laughs> some frustration. Uh, but I kind of like that about him. You know, I like so I like people showing their emotion. Um, why not? It's, it's going to hurt. He's disappointed that he he played crap over the four the last four or five holes and he he didn't get the job done. But again, credit's got to go to Morikawa. Um, you know, simply in golf to, to finish it off. But yeah, I enjoyed it. I, I haven't played golf out in Dubai yet, um, but I, but I intend to do so. There's a few good Northern Irish boys out there as well who who, who work in the golf mm-hmm. clubs who. You know, we'll be right. looking to touch base with and, uh, you know, hopefully get a game of golf with in, in the near future. Sure. Stephen, for you, you watched yeah, it? I, I, yeah, I, I'm with Stephen. I'd love to go out and play a bit of golf in Dubai. And yes, I, I did. I did watch it. And look, it was the unluckiest finish to a tournament I've, I've ever seen. I mean, when Rory hit the pin, it should have been stone dead for a birdie. Um, yeah. and, but, but the way it transpired, it was a two-shot swing. He then the real damage was then done at the next hole, which he bogeyed. The momentum just got sucked out of his round. And look, we know Rory's not in it to finish second, third, or fourth, or fifth, or top ten. He wanted to win the tournament, so once he knew he couldn't win, then that was that was that. It's yet to be proven. Did he actually rip this shirt off himself? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody actually saw him do it. No. So yeah. you know, yeah. you, you, did he catch it on the door? Possibly. I don't know. I'm joking. Um, but look, he obviously he cares. It shows that he wants to win. You know, he played some great golf during the week. He's back with Michael Bannon, his coach, which I was absolutely yeah. delighted to see. Um, you know, Michael Bannon's been there for for his entire life, and to have that person back with him, I think, is great. And anything that I saw from Rory in that tournament bodes well for 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 2022. Sure. And of course, yeah. he'd be disappointed not to win the tournament. But my goodness, how unlucky! You know, could, could you be? It was just it's that should have, that should have been a birdie, and if he had if he had got a birdie there, it wouldn't have surprised me if he'd gone on to win. But Morikawa, what a talent! Cool as a cucumber. Yeah. What an incredible season he's had. Yeah, amazing, gentlemen. Listen, thank you so much. Our as always has gone so quickly, um, and uh, we really, really appreciate really appreciate your time. Uh, absolutely yeah, brilliant. Absolutely. Thank you so much. For coming on, no problem. Enjoyed Thanks for having it. us. Thanks a million for having Not us. at all, boys. Listen, good luck with your golf match Cheers. coming up <laughs> <laughs> next uh, Monday, Bill. 
<laughs> yeah, okay. good man. We'll see you I've, got, I've got my money on Steve. Yeah, <laughs> oh, great, okay. Well, um, and we'll see you both at Loch Lomond Golf Club very soon. We definitely Thanks, will be. Well. Brilliant. Thanks, Amelia. Thanks, Thanks, fellas. See you soon. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's that then, Bill. A great entertainment chat there. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely big on the uh, on the rugby, and uh, you know, I could have followed up a wee bit on the Roy Keane, but I think I'll, I'll leave that to another time. Uh, but I could have followed up from Stephen, um, and his interview was uh, iconic. He was the only uh, guy that got to interview Roy when he stormed out of the uh, with his persistence. Uh, that was a massive, massive uh, scoop. Uh, to get but it was great the boys came on I mean I know they love their golf and they're passionate about it Um, so yeah another good show another good show Billy I've just got to say the first 20 minutes for technical reasons didn't record just ah. just seeing that now but we were all in from about 20 minutes onwards so right. hopefully oh, we missed the worst bits and got the best bits but yeah <laughs> okay. these things happen sometimes sausage oh, fingers dear. here Mr Burton but there we go um, okay Okay. Better late than never. We got we got a great chat in all the all the more. Uh, Willie's yeah. tips. We we didn't get a film off today because of technical difficulties. Yeah. How did the horse get on, Bill? Well, the horse didn't do so well. He went. It was sixteen to one. So it's creeping up now to about one hundred and eighty with three hundred and forty pounds in the kitty. Uh, so uh, anyway, um, we'll uh, uh, we'll we're still on the right side, but I think Willie's due a win next week. I think he's due a win next week. For sure. I think he is too. I'm sure he is. Yeah. He's a... so I'm, I'm currently at Dundonald Links, actually, and what a magnificent, uh, a, a absolutely incredible place. Uh, what they've put in here uh, in Ayrshire, definitely to do a show uh, from Dundonald Links, get uh, Ian Ferguson, uh, Ashley Pheasant on as well. Uh, that'll be, uh, I mean, this, this is an incredible place. So, and it's Ayrshire, you say, in the, in the kind of south west of scotland isn't it yes west of scotland, so you're sort of prestwick prestwick kind of area uh oh, i'm sorry to hear about the technical difficulties that's a bit of a blow so maybe the two boys will come back on but uh uh you know and, and we'll get another uh, another go with them uh that's a bit of a shame but uh okay uh listen everybody thank you very much for watching and uh, we'll see you next week cheers absolutely see you next week guys thanks bye. for joining us bye bye, bye, -bye.